Amen. Well, it's great to be here. Good morning, Briggs Road. Thank you for being here today. Um, Thank you, members. Thank you, guests. If you're here and you're joining us uh, for the first time today, we especially thank you for being here. And uh, we pray and hope this won't be your last time. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 3. The book of Romans, chapter 3. I am thankful that my God is a forgiving God. I'm thankful that my wife is a forgiving wife. (laughs) I'm thankful that my parents were forgiving parents. And do you ever think about forgiveness? Um, we, We like to be thankful for forgiveness in others, but think about forgiveness in ourselves. Um, forgiveness is a hard thing, isn't it? Because, you know, the old saying is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, There's no such thing as just totally free forgiveness either, is there? Because forgiveness offers a breach that has to be recompensed somehow. And I remember one time when I was a, a child, mom and dad made, they have to own part of the blame in this, but they bought me a slingshot. And this wasn't a little toy slingshot. This was like, uh, this was a, a really nice one. It was really sturdy, and it was made out of metal, and it had a bit, big, thick rubber band. That thing would go back forever. I mean, you could kill somebody with a slingshot. And Dad thought it would be a good idea for me to have that. And I, I was a kid, so don't judge me too harshly in this story. And, and one day, I was out in the yard playing, and I saw the cat. <laughs> And, and the cat was outside, and, and next to one of Mom's flower beds next to the house, I thought, I'm going to shoot the cat. No, no, hold, I'm, hold on. <laughs> oh, here we are. I may preach like this, okay, because I'm, I'm, I like these. What well, that looks sharp, doesn't it? Praise <laughs> the Lord. Anyway, I'm trying to distract you from I was trying to kill the cat. So, thankfully, I was a bad shot. I did not hit the cat. I did shoot... Mom and Dad's bedroom window. (laughs) And when I realized how much damage I did to the window, I realized, wow, sure, I'm glad I missed the cat. You know, I didn't hate it. That was a bad idea in retrospect. You know, kids are stupid. You know, sometimes I'm still stupid. You know, know, we do stupid things. You know, of course, Mom and Dad forgave me. I I think the slingshot was confiscated. I don't think I got that one back. Uh, but the point in telling this ridiculous story is, is that, you know, mom and dad, they love me. They didn't disown me. They didn't uh, kick me out of the house. You know, they forgave me, and the window got replaced. But the, the point of this is they, somebody had to pay for the window. And I guess mom and dad did. I, don't, I didn't have any money. But they, they paid for the window. And my point in using this illustration that the window was broken, it had to be fixed, is that any time that forgiveness is, is exercised, there is... There is an ownership of the breach in question by the forgiver. So if you forgive someone for a wrong they have done to you, you're acknowledging that either they cannot or will not repay that wrong, and you you just reconcile it. You forgive it. You let it go. And of course, we know this is what God has done for us in Christ. But I want to look today, I want to explore, as I've been talking about, the foundational issues for the church. I want to explore probably one of the most dense paragraphs in the New Testament. And I want to look at the doctrine that Martin Luther said the church stands or falls by. And that is the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, maybe you're here, maybe you're a believer, maybe you're not a believer, but you've heard about salvation, you've heard about forgiveness, you've heard about these terms very abstractly. I want to look at a passage today that tells us specifically how God is able to make us right with him and save us. We're going to look today at how, the why and the how, God saves us. And I, I want to just put this in your mind. Just as my parents had to pay for that window, there had to be, the debt could not just be done away with. It had to be dealt with. And I want you to think about this before we go into this. God 
I think sometimes we have this concept of God that God just forgives. He's a forgiving God, and so we just say, well, God's just, he's my good old buddy up in heaven, and he just forgives, and, and just abstractly, just because he wants to, and he likes me, and Ray's a good old guy, so, oh, Ray, don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. Sin's no big deal. I'll take care of it. That's not the way God works. As we saw last Sunday, God is a holy God. And so I want to look today at the book of Romans. I want to read chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, and I want to see how God is able to make us, who are sinners, to make us right with himself. Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I have heard, I have heard some preachers describe this paragraph that we've read this morning as the most important paragraph in the Bible. And I don't easily dispute that. Um, this paragraph ties together the book of Romans, and I would argue this paragraph unites all of the themes of sin, death, judgment, salvation, righteousness into one paragraph and gives us the gospel in, in, in a very solidified and crystallized paragraph. Now, I mentioned a few weeks ago that this year is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and I'm not going to give you a history lesson today. But, but I, hope, I hope you realize the importance of that even in our lives as Southern Baptists. We inherit a tradition of faith and a tradition of belief uh, that comes to us, of course, from the Bible, from Christ, from the beginning. Uh, but it has been stewarded by others. We stand here on 2,000 years of history and you think about history as something that is dry and boring, but I submit to you, we stand on 2,000 years of blood and ink and work and faithfulness of those who have carried the gospel to their own detriment many times so that you and I can have it today. 500 years ago, uh, various individuals, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, others, uh, saw the excesses in their day of the Roman church and began to go back to the gospel. And in the Roman Catholic Church at that time, and to some degree even to today, uh, there, there are excesses of work, of ritual, whereby men are said to be saved. And some of these men begin to read the Scriptures, and they begin to read texts like this, and to say, no, men are justified, they are saved by faith alone. There is nothing you can do to merit salvation. And I want to look at this passage, and I want to see why it's important and why we need to maintain this in our lives and in our churches. So I want you to notice here the first thing, we are justified through faith alone. Look here in verse 21. Paul says this, that the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. Now we're talking about a lot of high terms, a lot of high, high doctrinal terms. So let's try to break these down. Now what do we mean by the righteousness of God? We looked last week and we saw how that God was holy, how that He was righteous, how that He was so far above us and He was holy and just. Now, folks, the righteousness of God is a two-edged sword. The righteousness of God first is our greatest problem because we are sinners and we stand before a righteous and holy God and we do not meet His standards. But as we're going to see, the righteousness of God is also our salvation as we go through this passage. Now, what does this mean, righteousness of God apart from the law? Well, let's back up a moment. As we've talked about Scripture and what Scripture is, in the Old Testament, you have God's written, inspired Word. Jesus affirmed the Old Testament, the apostles affirmed the Old Testament, and we, of course, affirm the Old Testament as Scripture. And Paul is referring to this when he uses the words law or law and prophets. And he's, and he's talking about this. Now, why is this significant? 
The law was God's self-disclosure to man, to His people Israel. In the law, God gave His moral standards. God gave His commandments to be observed. And God reveals what it is to, to mean that He is holy and that we should be holy. So the law is really, for man at this point, God's disclosure, His righteousness revealed. His standards, His rules, His commandments. So for Paul to come along and then say, you know what, God has now done something different, and He's revealed His righteousness apart from the law. That's amazing. That's amazing, because He's revealing His character in a way other than the way that He's always done it. And He's not done it by a totally new thing, but He's done it by expanding on the old. And we're going to see that. Now, what does this mean? Why is this significant? This is significant for a lot of reasons. If you back up and read the, the two verses prior to our, our section, verses 19 and 20, you find this. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. God gave his perfect, absolutely complete moral standards to humanity, to Israel in the law. But the law cannot save us. The law can only condemn us. When you read the Ten Commandments, you shouldn't feel blessed immediately by them. You should feel burdened by them. Because you have not kept them, and neither have I. Okay? The Ten Commandments and the, all of the commandments of the law lay on us a great burden that we cannot bear. The book of Galatians goes so far as to say this, that everyone who, is, who relies on the works of the law are under a curse because everyone who does not abide by the things written in the book of the law are cursed. God says, the soul that sins against me, it shall die. So if God comes along and He gives us His law and He gives us His perfect standards and it says this, 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 and this is what must be done, but we can't and don't do those things, that is not good news. That is not good news to us. Now Paul says here, notice this, he upholds the law. He doesn't say that the law is bad. He doesn't say that the law is deficient. He doesn't say that it's broken. He even goes so far as to say this, now the righteousness of God is attested. It, it is attested by the law, and it is testified by the law. He said the law and prophets bear witness to it. So you have in the Old Testament, you have God's righteousness, fully disclosed, perfectly, without flaw, yet it cannot help us. It cannot do for us what we need done. So Paul says, you know what God's done? He's revealed His righteousness apart from the law. Now, now let's go a little further here. Look at what he says. Look at what he says. He clarifies. This is a clarifying statement. What righteousness is he talking about? He says, this is it in verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now, this is where we get the good news. Folks, when we stand before the God we talked about last Sunday, the one who is holy, 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 the one from whom the seraphim hide their faces because of His glory, when we stand before Him in His perfect law, we stand accused. But Jesus Christ has come on our behalf. And He has come to reveal God's law in, in, in a perfect, saving way. Think of the law. Think of the law as a huge container. Think of the law as like a huge, huge container. Let me, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a drum that you would fill up with, 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 with liquid of some sort. Maybe even bigger than that. Maybe, maybe like a water tower. Think of, think of the law like a water tower. And you've got a squirt gun, and you've got to fill that water tower up. That's how we stand before the law. Okay? The law is like a water tower that must be filled with water. And we stand with a squirt gun, and we cannot fill it. Now, how does Jesus reveal the righteousness of God? He comes, 
And he fills it to the full. He fills it to the full. And he completes that which we could never complete on our own. Not only that, but what he fills up, he also drinks, takes on himself. When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the Father. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Nevertheless, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. You see, here's the thing, folks. Jesus fulfilled all of the demands of the law. This is one way in which Jesus reveals God's righteousness. So here are all these commandments that must be done, that we've never done, that we can't keep, that we can't do. And Jesus comes, and he perfectly fulfills all of the demands of the law. But he doesn't only fulfill the demands of the law. Even though he fulfills the demands of the law, he dies in our place as though he did not fulfill those demands. He dies as a sinner for sinners, although he is sinless. He dies in the place of sinners being sinless. And this is how God brings his righteousness to us in a saving way. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Romans 1, 16-17 says, says this. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in what? In the gospel. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Galatians 2.16, Paul says, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus, in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Now what's the payoff for us today sitting in this room at Briggs Road Baptist Church? You will never perform well enough to please God. I don't care if you're here and you've been saved for a hundred years. Your performance will never merit the goodness of God. If you're here and you've been saved and you have fallen away from God and you have sinned, you will never repay God for that. Just like I didn't repay my parents for that window. I heard a man one time who was giving counsel and he was talking to a person and they said, the person said this, that this is that I have problems feeling guilty. And the person said, I feel guilty over things. I don't know if I should feel guilty over them. And so I don't know if I'm really at fault or if I should, what, should, what I should do with these feelings of guilt. And the man said, he said, what you should do, just own the guilt. And then give it to God. And then it has no power over you. Charles Spurgeon said this, if a man speaks ill of you, don't worry about it. He said, you're far worse than he thinks you to be. I mean... You know, I mean, let's be honest here. You know, if somebody spreads some rumor about me, you know, I know a ton of things that nobody, you know, in my sinful heart that nobody else knows. I'm just glad those are not being told, you know. I mean, let's be real. Let's be real for a moment here. Here's the thing, folks. When we own, I know it sounds depressing at first. Oh, you're really lifting our hearts up, telling us how sinful we are. Folks, when we realize how destitute we are, that is freeing. It frees us from having to perform. It frees us from having to achieve. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't pursue sanctification. That doesn't mean that God doesn't shape us and grow us. But folks, here's the thing. You were an unworthy sinner when God saved you. And when you die, you will die an unworthy sinner. And you will stand before God on one ground and one ground only, and that is the merits of Jesus Christ. And if you don't stand on those merits, you will never stand before God. That is the only way. That is the only way you will ever stand before God. And do you know, you know something about evangelism? It's much easier to save people from their sins than it is to save them from their righteousness. If people can never admit their true position before God, they can never receive the gospel. We have to be sinners. We have to be destitute. We have to be broken before we can be mended. And the law, the perfect witness of God's righteousness, condemns us, it kills us, it destroys us. But Jesus comes along and He fills up all that which we could not fill up, and then He drinks it all, the wrath of God in our place. This is important. 
Christianity stands at odds with every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world is a religion of human performance. You get the results of your performance. Christianity, true biblical Christianity, stands alone as a religion, as a faith in which we benefit from Christ's performance. If you're performing, you need to stop. If you're trying to achieve, you need to stop. You need to rest in the goodness of God's grace. We are beggars and we need charity of a heavenly sort. We are justified through faith alone. And notice this, this comes to those who believe, those who believe on Christ, those who trust Christ alone for their salvation. These are the people to whom the righteousness of God ceases to be a voice of condemnation and begins to be the source of their salvation. Now, as we go through this passage, you're going to see how the righteousness of God not only condemns us, but it's also what saves us. It's not that God saves, condemns in His righteousness and by something else He saves us. He saves us even in His righteousness. Now, let's move forward. Firstly, we looked that we were justified through faith alone. Secondly, I want you to notice this. We are justified as a gift of grace. As a gift of grace. Now, it might be easy to think, well, if I'm justified by faith, then I've got my faith to think. You know, I've got such great faith. God looked down and said, oh, Ray's so faithful. Oh, he's got such good faith. Look at the faith Ray has. I'm going to give Ray salvation in exchange for this great faith. You see, we can't, we can't go there. Even though we are saved by faith alone, it is a gift of grace. And folks, even the faith that you believe by is a gift from God. It's all of grace. If there's any merit that factors into this at all, we are no better than the other religions. We're no better than the state of Roman Catholicism at the point of the Reformation. We have abominated the gospel. It must be by grace and grace alone. Let's look and see what the scriptures say. Look at the last part of verse 22. And he says... The righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And here's why. Here's the statement. Why? For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let's stop right there. No distinction in who? Well, I mentioned a couple weeks ago when we were in Romans um, that the book of Romans is really a letter written immediately at its time. Paul's writing to describe how the Jews and Gentiles should do church together and do theology together. Because here's this idea, you've got Jews who were a privileged people who had the law, they had the commandments, they had the promises, they had the fathers, they had all these advantages. Then you have over here, you have the Gentiles who were just these, these pagans. And so, you, you, this, is, this is a recurring theme in the New Testament, this, this, this tension. And this thing keeps trying to resurrect itself. We see it in Acts 15, we see it here. The book of Galatians is entirely devoted to this idea that the Jews are somehow privileged and, and have other access or have other ways of achieving salvation. Well, surely, surely this must be true. This is, this is the logic. You know, if God has favored them so much, uh, the nation of Israel, to give them the law, surely there's a way that they, by, by virtue of who they are, or their nearness to the things of God, surely there's a way for them to be saved. Well, if you read the previous chapters, chapters 1 and 2, and the previous parts of three up to this passage, Paul is simply building a case against every human person. Chapter 1, verses 18 and down, is all about how sinful the Gentile world is. We've misinterpreted that passage as a church. We've made it how bad those people out there are. No, it's, a, it's an indictment against every Gentile person. Paul says, you know what Gentiles do? He says, they look and they see that God's created this world. They still worship idols. And he's not talking about Jewish people because they worship Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. He's talking about Gentiles. He said, they even exchange the glory of God for the images of beasts. They worship idols. They worship creatures. And he goes on and talks about, he says, and he says, they even uh, will go into homosexual things. And it's not a passage about homosexuality primarily. It's a passage about sin. And he goes on and talks about the other sins that they do and sins that we do. He's talking about what Gentiles apart from God look like. And then chapter two, he makes a U-turn. He says, all right, 
You, you, you Jews, you Israelites, you who judge the Gentiles. He says, you have no excuse. He says, because you do the exact same things. And so in chapter 1, Paul talks about how lost, how away from God Gentiles are. And in chapter 2, he turned to look at the Jews and said, you know what? You think you're better off? You're just closer to the fire, friend. You think you're better off because you have the law? No, you're going to be judged with a greater judgment because you're that close to the law. And he talks about the lostness, both of Jews and of Gentiles. And, and the argument here is this, everyone, it doesn't matter if you were born into a Christian home. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your lineage. It doesn't matter who you are. You have sinned. You have broken God's law. I think there's this idea, and I think sometimes the media represents it this way, that we, we pharisaical Christians, we think that we're great. And everybody out there, uh, you know, the liberals and the homosexuals, they're sinners. You know what? God is going to judge the homosexual and the liberal right beside the conservative who rejects Jesus. God will, re God will judge the heterosexual adulterer the same as he judges the homosexual. Folks, we need to understand this. God is a judge of sin. And we all fall under the judgment of God. And apart from the grace of God, we are doomed. Our only hope is the grace of Jesus Christ. So he builds this case. He says, you know what? Jews, Gentiles, both lost. And so there's a universal problem. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 3, the same chapter, verses 9 through 12, Paul says, What then? Are, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Our fundamental problem is a problem of sin. It all comes back to sin. So there's a universal problem. It affects every person born. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, the standards of God. So it naturally follows that God has provided a universal solution. No matter who you are, no matter where you hail from, no matter who your people are, God has provided a solution whereby all can come to Him. And this is here in verse 24, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice the parallel statements. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is where we're getting to the heart of it, justification. Justification. The word justify here, that's a verb in our text, or justification, it actually is, is the same root word as the word righteousness. What, what I wanted to do today, but I thought it might be confusing for those of you reading out of, out of your text. I wanted to just translate this myself. And so where it says, all of sin falls short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace. I wanted to put, are made righteous or righteous. Because it kind of gives you the, the, the full brunt of it. Because the issue at stake here is God's righteousness. Well, justification is simply God righteousing us. Do you understand that? It's no less than God giving us that which kills us to save us. God's righteousness is the problem. God's righteousness is, is it's not the problem, it's not at fault, but it is, it is our problem. It is our condemnation. But the, what God does to save us, this word justify literally means He makes us righteous. It's the same word. He righteouses us, if you could say that. He, 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 he righteouses us. Makes us righteous. He looks at us helpless. He says, you can't do right. You won't do right. I will make you right. This is what a righteous God does for us. You can't do right. You won't do right. I will make you right. He saves us even in His righteousness. And we're going to see why that's so important in a moment. We're justified, but now don't miss this. We're justified by His grace as a gift God saves us wholly through grace as a gift. Romans 5.1, same book. I'm referring to Romans a lot because it's all, it all pulls together here. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are by nature enemies of God. We are by nature hateful to God. Oh, goodness. But through justification, we are made to be at peace with God. This is the great grace of Jesus Christ. Notice this. It's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word redemption there is a word that was used and is and usually, in almost all cases, it's a word that means payment, involves payment. It was used to refer to ransoms or prices paid for slaves. To ransom them and buy their freedom. And this is the word that is used to talk about what Jesus has done for us. He has ransomed us. He has paid our ransom to free us. On the cross, that is where the ransom was paid. And you, friend, cannot add to that. And you can't take away from it. Jesus Christ has bought you. He has paid for you. He has ransomed you as a gift through His blood. The word justification or justify here, I'm going to read you a short definition by John MacArthur. He says this, This verdict includes pardon from the guilt of, and penalty of sin, and the imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer's account, which provides for the positive righteousness man needs to be accepted by God. God declares a sinner righteous solely on the basis of the merits of Christ's righteousness. God imputed a believer's sin to Christ's account in His sacrificial death, and He imputes Christ's perfect obedience to God's law to Christians. The sinner receives this gift of God's grace by faith alone. And now thirdly and finally, I want you to notice this. We've looked at, we are justified through faith alone. We're justified as a gift of grace. Thirdly, I want you to notice this. This is important. This, this brings it together. We are justified because of Jesus' blood. Folks, there is a problem with justification. There's a problem. I... I, I We've sort of revealed the answer a little bit, but I hope you see a little tension here. There's a problem with justification. In Exodus 34, 6, 7, the Lord passes before Moses and the Lord says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, that's good, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Did you get that? God's gracious. He forgives iniquity. He forgives sin. Notice the second part. But who will by no means clear the guilty? Did, did, did you catch that? Did you catch that 180 there? God is a gracious God. He's merciful. He, he forgives iniquity. But He will by no means clear the guilty. How? How can God forgive sin at the same time refusing to pardon the guilty. That seems to be a contradictory statement, doesn't it? It seems to be a contradictory statement. In Proverbs 17, 15, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. God says, for example, in, in, in a court of law, a judge who would let a, a wicked man go free is an abomination to the Lord. That's a perversion of justice. On the other hand, one who would condemn the righteous, it's a perversion of justice. We feel this, don't we, in our culture. When we, when we see an injustice, when we see a miscarriage of justice, when we see people fail to be prosecuted for evil they've done, we, we, our hearts cry out, we want that to be rectified. We've all seen that. We've all felt that. We feel that in this fallen world. And you know what that is? That's, that's not hypocrisy. That's, that's, that's a sense of justice. We want the scales to balance. That is a right thing. But God's a holy God, and He wants that more than we do. So how does this happen? How does God justify us and stay true? How does He look at a sinner and say, well, Ray is Ray's justified when I'm in fact a sinner? How does He do that and stay true? How does He do that and, and, and not be found to lie. How does he do that and be still holy? How is he not an unjust judge? Paul tells us. 
Paul tells us here. God can justify sinners because of these three statements. Now notice here, there are three purpose statements in verses 25 and 26. Three purpose statements. And I want you to notice these. This was to show, it was to show, and so that. Those are three purpose statements and they all tell us what happened. Now it's all based here in verse 25. It talks about Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. The word propitiation means, it's literally the Old Testament counterpart, means mercy seat. It's the place where God's wrath was appeased, where sacrifice was made, and blood was shed. Jesus is our substitute. He is our sacrifice. He is our propitiation. So in the Old Testament, sacrifices were made on an altar. And they would be killed, and their blood would be shed, and their body would be burned. And these would be lambs and goats and bulls, what have you. And that's the word, using, talking of that place where the, the blood was sprinkled. That's what's being said about Jesus here. And on the Day of Atonement in Israel, there was one day when the whole nation would be atoned for. It's called the Day of Atonement. And the high priest would go in. He would go in one, once a year. He'd go into the Holy of Holies, the Holiest of Holies. And he would take the blood that was offered outside on the altar, and he would carry that blood all the way in. He'd go through the Holy of Holies, and he'd go into the Holiest of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and only once a year would this room be entered. He'd take the blood of the sacrifice, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and symbolically that represented the cleansing of the entire nation. And God, in this one word, propitiation, is saying that's what Jesus is for us. Okay? Now, the first purpose statement. God made Jesus to be a propitiation so that, or for this reason, to bear the sins that God had previously forgiven. Notice the words here. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins. Now, whoa, wait a minute. God's passing over sins. What, what, what's all this? This sounds like God is an unjust judge. He's passing over sins. He's not judging sin. Well, yes. Psalm 32, 1, 2. David was a man of God, but he committed adultery. He committed murder. He was a sinner. And David says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Folks, the book of Hebrews tells us this, that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and lambs to take away sins. Although they went through the ritual and they went through the commandments of God and they offered the sacrifices in the Old Testament, not one drop of animal blood ever actually cleansed any sin. Never. Never. But you have a gracious God forgiving the sins of the likes of David. You have a gracious God. If you go into Romans chapter 4, the very next chapter, Paul uses two examples. He uses David, the, the king who committed adultery. He uses Abraham, uh, the man who believed God, but yet he committed sins. God forgave these men. He justified these men. And although they offered sacrifices, the sacrifices never took away sin. So you have this outstanding sin that has not been paid. Not one sin in the nation of Israel was ever absolved on the Day of Atonement. It was symbolically done so. It was pictured to be done so. But these pictures were shadows of the one sacrifice that would come. When Jesus died on that cross, His blood atoned for every sin prior from creation to cross that had ever been forgiven by God. This balances the scales. This allows God to be God, to be righteous and forgive sin. David's adultery with Bathsheba was judged at Calvary on the son of David who bled for his ancestor. All the sins that were forgiven on those days of atonement, year in, year out, they were laid on the Lamb of God and He specifically, individually, was punished for all of those sins. Jesus balanced the books from creation to cross for the sins that in God's grace He had passed over. If Jesus had not gone to the cross, a lot of Old Testament saints would have had their, would have had their status revoked. Because this is where it centers. 
So, Jesus had to die. He had to be propitiation because God had passed over sins and, and not judged them. And He saved their judgment to lay on His only Son. But not only that. So it's not only the, righteous, uh, the sins that were formerly passed over, but verse 26, it was to show, the second purpose statement, it was to show His righteousness at the present time. Not just in the former times, but at the present time so that he might be just and justifier the one who has faith in Jesus. For God to be righteous and to have forgiven all of those sins prior to the cross, Jesus had to pay for them. For God to be righteous and to forgive your sins today, Jesus had to pay for them. So not only did Jesus pay for the sins from creation to cross, he paid for the sins from cross to eternity. You can be forgiven. And when you pray the model prayer and say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us, you're saying, Lord, account the blood of Jesus an acceptable sacrifice for my sins. Every sin must be accounted for or God is unjust. And notice this last purpose statement. So that He, that is God, might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I love that verse. I have a God who has forgiven me, but He's not forgiven me in a way that compromises His holiness. I have a God who forgives me, yet He remains righteous. I have a God who has judged every one of my sins in the person of Jesus Christ. God doesn't just abstractly just say, oh, that's okay, we'll, we'll wipe that under the rug. Every sin was laid on His darling Son for you and I. God does not simply judge your sin. He puts your sin on Jesus and judges Jesus. God did not crush your sin only, but He put your sin on Jesus and He crushed Jesus. This is how God dealt with our sin to save us and to remain God. Folks, this is salvation. This is the core of what we believe. If we lose this, if we go into work salvation, if we lose the holiness of God, if we lose the person of God, we've lost it all. We have to have this at the core of our belief in faith. Father, I thank you for your word. And I pray today as we have, we've, we've explored a very lofty passage of Scripture and Lord, I pray, God, that we have, we have loved you to go through this to see what you have to say to us about the gospel. Lord, I pray today that if there's one who is here, who is under the weight of their own sin, and they've never trusted Christ as their propitiation, as their sufficient sacrifice, Lord, I pray today that they would know that, sac that sacrifice is available, that provision is available, that they can call on you, God, and you will save them. So, Lord, I pray today that you will work in hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.